Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Weiss, and I'm the director of Sandy Spring Museum. Sorry for the delay. We're having a couple of complications um, behind the scenes. Um, I'd like to start um, with a land statement. During these difficult times that we've experienced as individuals and as a country, Sandy Spring Museum, too, has experienced challenges grappling with the role we play in a system that benefits some at the expense of others. Sandy Spring Museum stands firmly with those fighting against racism, structural disadvantages, and systemic injustice that have oppressed Black people in the United States for hundreds of years. The United States was built on discriminatory practices that were codified in our legal system, beginning with the dehumanization of Native people, followed by enslaving Black people in bondage as property for the financial benefit of those of white European ancestry. Sandy, Sandy Spring Museum stands on land that was once a plantation where Black people were enslaved. We recognize that the museum is the beneficiary of a historically unjust system, and we're committed to working towards dismantling systems that perpetuate racism and discrimination in order to build a just, equitable society. Tonight's program is one of many programs that we host that challenge the dominant narrative. So before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of introduction of our guests. Um, for this evening. Um, we have three guests with us. Um, I'll first start by introducing Robert Dunham, who is the Executive Director of the Death Penalty Information Center and has been so since March 2015. A nationally recognized expert on the death penalty, Mr. Dunham has 25 years of experience as a capital litigator and teacher of death penalty law, including arguing in the United States Supreme Court. Before joining the Death Penalty Information Center, he served as the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Capital Case Resource Center, the Director of Training of the Philadelphia Federal Defender's Capital Habeas Unit, and as an Assistant Federal Defender in the Harrisburg PA Court Habeas Unit. Together, these three offices obtained more than 300 stays of execution and overturned 150 unconstitutionally obtained death sentences. Also from the Death Penalty Information Center, we have Ngozi Ndulue. She is the director, Senior Director of Research and Special Projects. Her legal, legal career has focused on the intersection of racial justice and the criminal legal system. At the Death Penalty Information Center, she endeavors to deepen the public's understanding of the origins, functioning, and impact of the death penalty. She conducts original research, supervises data collection and analysis, and lead strategic planning initiatives. She's also the lead author of the Death Penalty Information Center September 2020 report entitled Enduring Injustice, the Persistence of Racial Discrimination in the U.S. Death Penalty. Also joining us this evening is Kenneth Reams. Following a botched robbery at a drive through ATM where his friend shot and killed a man in the heat of a struggle, Kenneth Reams was convicted of capital murder under Arkansas's felony murder statute and sentenced to death, becoming the then youngest inmate on Arkansas's death row, despite not having pulled the trigger. Today, Kenneth Reams is an artist, a social justice activist, and the founder of Who Decides, Inc., a nonprofit that aims to raise awareness through the arts of the racial, ethical, and socioeconomic issues intertwined with the history and practice of capital punishment in America. While the courts recently overturned Mr. Reams' death sentence in 2018, stating that he never should have been sentenced to death, Reams has been incarcerated for 25 years for a capital murder that he did not commit. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Robert and Ngozi. Thank you so much, and it's great to be with everyone today. Um, we were really excited when we were invited to talk about um, the racial history of the death penalty, what, how racial injustice persists, persists today, and also the humanity um, that sometimes is missing from conversations um, about the death penalty. So Rob and I are going to uh, be both talking about um, the facts, the history, and the, the policy, and we'll leave time for Kenneth to, to really share um, his story and also his art. So, um, and right now, I want to center us in the That's moment. Right. Oh, I think I'm starting to echo. Um, center us in the moment where we have learned as the United States, and I'm going to be focusing on the, the United States. Um, that the tough on crime policies of the last um, 
50 years, really. We talk about the 90s, but we know that there was a buildup and and um, and, in, and slow uh, increase that really became a tidal wave in these top and crime policies. And we know that those don't work, are counterproductive, are not creating safer communities and are not addressing the harm um, that has been uh done when there is actual um, crime committed. And that's been done to communities that have been devastated by uh, this era of mass incarceration. So in this moment, I think it's really important to actually think about the death penalty as part of that context, um, as part of uh, this uh, linchpin of this carceral system. So when we think about that, we need to look at the historical context and how that has uh, carried through to this day. Um, so when we think about the role of racial injustice and the death penalty, um, that's something that has existed since the beginning, before the beginning of the United States. We can go back to the colonial period and see harsher punishments, um, different crimes that were considered capital crimes, uh, their use of the death penalty being very focused on uh, the accepted racial caste system at that time. Black people were um, being uh, tortured to death in ways in the legally, um, in ways that would not have been accepted um, for white people. The death penalty was being used as a tool for uh, conquest and genocide um, with regards to Native Americans. Um, we see the these roots of uh, the racial um, injustice in the death penalty today in that history. And when while we're going kind of back into time to colonial periods, there's a through line um, of racial injustice then and the way that it manifests in today's death penalty. So thinking about um, that and looking at modern times, we know that right now you could not have a, a law that specifically said that based on race, um, you are more, uh, you are eligible for the death penalty based on the race, your race or the race of the person who is the victim of, of the crime you're charged for. However, we see a reality um, where that's actually what's happening. So we know that in the modern death penalty era, since the 1970s, 75% uh, of um, the cases in which uh, someone has been executed, the victims were white. We know that that's not about um, who is the victim of crime. We know that this the white people are victims of crime in about half uh, the homicide cases. So this is not about, uh, this is just how crime happens. Um, but instead it's about, this is the crime that we have decided to punish with the death penalty. This is uh, a, a death penalty system that is supposed to be designed to uh, focus on the worst of the worst crimes, on the most culpable people, but when we make those definitions, even though uh, we could not write into the law um, that race plays a factor in determining who fits into those categories, we know that in practice, that is very much what we do, that race is just as salient as a factor as the official aggravating factors that are written in uh, to capital punishment statutes. And so when we know that, the question is, and what do we do about that? We've had the answers from courts uh, across the, the country and the United States Supreme Court in particular. Uh, and the United States Supreme Court, when uh, confronted with the evidence of the serious racial bias in the death penalty, when confronted um, with uh, detailed statistical evidence about the way that the death penalty was operating in Georgia, uh, the Supreme Court assumed that it was true, assumed that this statistical evidence showed what we thought it showed, and decided that that just wasn't enough. Seeing how the death penalty operates in real life was just not enough because we couldn't show that there was 
somebody behind the scenes who's saying, I want to impose the death penalty because of uh, a person's race. There was not this proof of purposeful discrimination um, that even though these mountains of evidence of how the death penalty works um, was uh, provided and was accepted uh, by the United States Supreme Court. So in a, a country where our highest court has said, yeah, so, you know, yeah, the, this is the way that the death penalty operates. And so that's just the way things are. Um, there have been a number of, of um, articles written. Uh, there have been, where there was a, there's a number of uh, people who have expressed outrage at the time, but we still ended up with the same death penalty. We still ended up with a death penalty that continued to operate in that way. The, um, that pivotal uh, Supreme Court case, McCleskey versus Kemp, uh, was decided in 1987. Um, and here we are uh, in 2021 uh, with the death penalty still on the books in about half our states. Um, but here we are, and but we're in a different era. We're in a moment where we have decided and recognized that the way that the criminal legal system works uh, has, isn't working for us, that we need new solutions and new perspectives. We've also recognized that the burdens that have been created by the criminal legal system are not being felt equally. We know that uh, when a, a Black person is a victim of crime, there's a different uh, probability of arrest. Uh, we know that when we're talking about jury selection, that there are a number of ways uh, that people can be discriminated against at each phase in choosing who will be called for jury service, in deciding who is kind of legally disqualified um, from serving on a, a capital uh, trial, as a juror on a capital trial, in the discretionary strikes that prosecutors are using um, to supposedly for race neutral reasons, uh, exclude people from the jury that end up disproportionately falling on people of color. Um, so we've seen a criminal legal system that has been counterproductive, has been lopsided in the way that it operates. And people have been connecting the dots not just to say saying that racial bias in one aspect, one uh, part of the criminal legal system is important. We people have connected the dots to say if we have this racial discrimination in the death penalty, which is supposed to be the part of the criminal legal system that has the most procedural protections, it's supposed to be the part of the criminal legal system where we have actively worked to decrease arbitrariness, to ensure that the, the right people under our uh, standards are the people who actually get this punishment. And even there, we're seeing persistent, well-documented racial bias at every stage from the time of arrest to conviction, to appeal, to deciding whether somebody gets executive clemency um, and to eventual execution. And recognizing that we see this racial bias at, at what you could see as the apex um, of the criminal legal system, what should be a model of fairness, uh, has actually extended to our conversations about, well, if we have a uh, uh, racially biased death penalty, what does that mean for the person who has been uh, charged with a misdemeanor and who might be making bail decisions that will result in pretrial detention that could make them lose their job, uh, custody of their kids, um, the apartment that they're living in. So knowing that we're in a moment where there's uh, significant activism about ending mass incarceration, about ending police violence um, against uh, Black people and other people of color, um, against addressing ways where the race of victims um, affects who is actually getting justice, thinking about stand your ground in the way that 
the standard round defense has been used uh, to justify um, the murder of black and brown people and recognizing that that is all part of a continuum. So in that, in this situation, we see people who are um, part of the Black Lives Matter movements in Oklahoma City, who are talking about the need for um, police reform, talking about the need for sentencing reform, and talking about the need uh, for Julius Jones, who is uh, a Black man who is facing execution in Oklahoma, uh, later this year, who actually has a recommendation that his sentence be committed, commuted um, because uh, uh, of evidence of innocence. He's also a person who is uh, who was convicted of killing a white man. Again, when we know that one of the places of highest racial disparity um, is when there is um, a black defendant and a white victim that interracial um, homicides, even though they are um, much uh, less common, we're st we still see that this is a place where there's is rife for racial bias to affect prosecutorial charging, jury decision making. In, in that situation where Julius Jones's case is being um, championed along with um, discussions about how the entire criminal legal system operates, I think we see where the conversations that we're having about racial bias in the death penalty are crucial right now. Um, they're connected to the fights against a variety of issues that um, are, result, are connected to racial justice um, in the criminal legal system, and that we have to really understand them in um, the big picture context. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to um, hand things off to uh, Rob Dunham, our Executive uh, Director of Death Penalty Information Center, who's going to go a little bit deeper um, into the work that we did in Enduring Injustice and um, some stories of um, individuals who have been affected. Thank you, Ngozi. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank the museum for um, uh, for giving us this opportunity to speak with you tonight, uh, and also uh, for the fundamentally important thing uh, that it does, which is recognize people's humanity. Uh, one of the things about the death penalty is it decides that individuals uh, are disposable and it dehumanizes them. Uh, and there is nothing like art to show uh, that people uh, are are in fact uh, important members of uh, of our humanity, uh, and the um, the exhibits that the museum uh, has uh, that you ought to see, uh, and I think the exhibits uh, that the art that uh, the Mr. Reams uh, creates uh, are really life affirming and humanity affirming. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you to uh, uh, to the museum. Uh, for that and for Kenneth for his work. Uh, I want to share with you um, if this works. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to share with you some information that is some that's going to be difficult. And uh, there are some images that are unpleasant. Uh, and I want to warn you about them uh, in advance, because when you talk about the death penalty and you talk about the effects uh, uh, of the death penalty on society and you talk about its racist roots, there are going to be images that are uncomfortable. Uh, I just want to let you know about that in advance. Um, there are also uh, things that, um, that are uh, are uplifting and make you understand somebody's humanity and, and that, that people who are on death row, uh, whether they got there because of, uh, of illegitimate reasons uh, or even if they were guilty, um, these are human beings. And these are human beings 
who have uh, many things to contribute. Uh, what you see on the screen right now is some of the artwork uh, from my former client, Robert Cook, uh, who is no longer on death row, but was on death row in Philadelphia for, uh, for more than a decade and a half. Uh, and these are some of, uh, some of his uh, images. And if you're interested in them, um, the museum has contact numbers for us uh, and I can give you um, a, uh, an Instagram number uh, where you can see more of, uh, of Robert's work. Um, uh, when we're talking about the death penalty uh, and we're talking about race and we're talking about history, um, no one is better uh, at describing it than Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, and um, uh, we went to uh, the opening of the Memorial to Peace and Justice uh, in April of 2018. Uh, and there is nothing, uh, I think, uh, th th this, is, this is a stunning memorial. Uh, it is a life-changing memorial um, when, you, uh, when, when you go and you see it. Uh, so I would recommend that uh, to everybody. Uh, but just remember, uh, the concept of truth and reconciliation. And we can't have reconciliation until we recognize the truth. Um, here is some of what I think, some of the images and some of the facts uh, that link the death penalty directly to our legacy of lynching um, and slavery uh, and Jim Crow segregation. And again, the next several images uh, are, uh, are uh, painful uh, to see, um, but I think it's important to see them uh, to be able to understand fully the relationship of lynching and capital punishment. Um, this is a picture, um, and this is, uh, this is a picture from a public square. Uh, this is 1893. This is Texas, uh, and several thousand white people are showing up on the courthouse lawn uh, and um, you can't see the picnic baskets, but there are picnic baskets. Uh, and there are literally thousands uh, of white people here on the public square. Uh, and they are there to see the killing uh, of, uh, of an African-American man uh, on charges of rape. And here is another picture. Uh, and this is from 1936. And this is from... Um, uh, from Kentucky, Owens, uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, and there are thousands of people, um, and you can see that they are white people and they are dressed uh, in, uh, in suits and ties uh, and some of their Sunday best with their picnic baskets. Uh, and there's the gallows, uh, and on the gallows is another uh, African-American man uh, who is about to be hanged. When you put the two of them Together, what you'll see is one is a lynching and one is an execution. Uh, and they are virtually visually indistinguishable, except that on the left of your screen, when you look, you can see the lynching of Henry Smith on the courthouse lawn of Paris, Texas in 1893. You can see the word justice that is painted. And that's the lynching. The word justice is not painted. Uh, on, the, um, on the gallows, uh, the execution of Rainey Bethea on the courthouse lawn in o Owensboro. Um, but what you need to know is that public execution, that was the last public execution uh, in the United States. It didn't have to happen on the courthouse lawn. But under Kentucky law, if you were charged with murder and you were convicted of murder and you were sentenced to death for murder, you would be executed inside the state penitentiary. But if you were charged with rape and convicted of rape and sentenced to death for rape, you would be executed in public in the county where the charges were brought. And so the prosecutors in Mr. Bethea's case intentionally did not pursue murder charges because what they wanted was the public display, the public display of a black man being hanged in front of thousands of white people on the courthouse lawn. That is exactly the same image you get in these public terror lynchings. And you can tell 
from the from the reaction by Kentucky public officials, but also from the spectacle that it created, uh, that it serves exactly the same emotional purpose that lynching served. And it serves exactly the same social injustice purpose using the system of law as, a, as an instrument of oppression, of an instrument, as an instrument of racial terror, uh, as a device intended to put African Americans in their place. Um, the lynchings tell, tell us that we can reach out and get you at any time if we want to. The public spectacle of these executions tell us exactly the same thing. And they are a graphic uh, illustration, a visual illustration of the link between lynchings and capital punishment. This is a map that um, Ngozi had in the race report. Uh, and it's another way of visualizing the link between lynchings and the death penalty. The locations in which lynchings occurred, which you can see on the map on the left, are the same locations in which African Americans are being executed today. Uh, and there are all sorts of sociological studies that have been done uh, that show that the uh, states that have the lynchings are the states that, um, that carry out capital punishment, that the counties in the states that had the most lynchings are the counties in the states with the highest rates of violence uh, today. Uh, and that if you are in a state with high levels of lynchings, you're much more likely to have executions there and you're much more likely to disproportionately have executions uh, targeted at African-American defendants. Uh, and another link between lynching and the death penalty uh, was rape. Uh, rape was one of the things that most provoked lynchings. And it didn't have to be an accurate charge of rape. It just had to be a charge of rape. Uh, many, many innocent people uh, were lynched uh, for, uh, for allegations of improper sexual conduct towards uh, a white woman. What we find when we look at the way the death penalty was administered for rape, uh, we see that uh, between 1930 and 1972, uh, you had 455 people who were executed and nearly 90% of them were black. And 97% of the executions occurred in the former Confederate states. So there is a clear, clear cultural and political um, link between lynchings and the use of the death penalty um, for rape as an instrument of social control. Because we know, we know fully that 90% of rapes are not committed by African Americans. Uh, and 97% of uh, rapes are not committed in the old Confederacy. But that's where the punishment is, and that's where the punishment was directed. Um, at African-American males. And at the same time, no white person, no white man has ever been executed in the United States for the rape of a black woman or child uh, in which nobody was killed. Very recently, Virginia abolished the death penalty and Virginia in doing so took a look at its racist history. Virginia has executed more people than any other state in the United States. Now, it started earlier because uh, Virginia, the Virginia colonies uh, began uh, way before Texas uh, was even um, imagined to be a potential state. Uh, but the fact is that more people have been executed in Virginia than any other place in the United States. Uh, and in the modern era, from the 1970s forward, uh, it was the second most prolific executioner behind only Texas. When we look at the history uh, in Virginia, uh, as recounted in the report, um, you will, you'll see that Virginia had racially discriminatory laws and treated people differently uh, for purposes of capital punishment, depending on the race of the victim uh, and the race of the defendant. Uh, crimes involving white victims were punishable by death in circumstances in which crimes involving black victims were not. 
crimes involving white defendants, uh, excuse, excuse me, black defendants, were punishable by death in circumstances in which crimes involving uh, white defendants were not. Uh, and when it became illegal uh, to discriminatorily um, uh, select uh, for punishment somebody based on race, uh, the states began making certain crimes, uh, making death penalty discretionary for certain crimes. Uh, and this graphic here illustrates the way that discretion was carried out uh, in the period from 1900 uh, until um, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down all existing death penalty laws, uh, crimes that did not involve death, rape, attempted rape, armed robbery, as applied in Virginia, you had a grand total of zero white defendants executed, uh, and you have only black defendants executed for rape, only black defendants executed for attempted rape, only black defendants uh, executed uh, for armed robbery, uh, and Black defendants executed at four times the rate uh, as white defendants uh, when it comes to murder. So there is a direct link. There's a direct link, uh, not just psychologically, as we saw from the, uh, from the graphic images, uh, not just geographically, but also substantively uh, to, um, to lynching. So through, there's a through uh, line uh, that we see. And so let's take a look nationwide. This is a map of US executions by, rape, by, by race of defendant. And look at, look at the darker space here. Uh, and then I'm going to click to the next map. You can see that uh, much more orange shows up. Uh, that's because the first was the race of the defendants. The second is the race of the victims. Uh, and you can see that disproportionately defendants who are executed are defendants of color and disproportionately um, the people uh, for whom, uh, for whose murder they have been executed uh, are white. Um, lawyers are fond of saying we're lawyers because we don't do math and here's some advanced math, but here's a, here's a graphic uh, that um, looks complicated, but what it comes down to is that no matter how terrible a defense, a, a, an offense is, whatever the level of severity, a death sentence is more likely to be imposed in two circumstances. One, if the defendant is black. Two, if the victim isn't. So um, this is from a study from Philly um, uh, where, where I practiced. Uh, and one of the things that we saw was uh, not only does the race of the defendant make a difference and the race of the victim make a difference, but when you have a black defendant and a white victim, what the black defendant looks like makes a difference. Uh, the study showed that if you had more European looking features, you're an African American charged with the murder of a white person. If you had more traditional European looking features, uh, as, uh, for example, uh, the man on the left does, uh, on your, your left looking at the screen, uh, or uh, as compared to having more traditionally African looking features, uh, darker skin, um, as we see with the man on the right of your screen, well, you were twice as likely to be sentenced to death for the murder of a white victim if you looked more African. And that tells us a lot about um, the kind of visceral nature uh, of capital punishment uh, and the implicit, if not explicit, racial bias that goes into sentencing decisions. Very recently, Governor Hogan granted posthumous pardons uh, to 34 Maryland lynching victims, including Howard Cooper, uh, who at 15 years old uh, was sentenced to death and then lynched while his case was pending uh, on appeal uh, in the United States Supreme Court. We've heard about the Scottsboro Boys and that injustice uh, and the posthumous pardons uh, that they got. Uh, the Martinsville Seven um, were, uh, were recently in the news at the same time that Virginia was doing its repeal because these seven men uh, were convicted and sentenced to death for rape uh, and um, uh, there is some dispute as to whether any of them were guilty, but it's beyond dispute that five of them at least were not. Uh, and they each were tried um, in front of all white, all male juries 
in trials that lasted minutes, not days, uh, and they were sentenced to death and they were executed in the uh, what's amounted to the largest mass execution uh, in the United States uh, for a crime in which nobody was killed. The Groveland Four um, were, and they were posthumously pardoned this year. The Groveland Four were posthumously pardoned 40, um, for, for a crime that also occurred um, almost 70 years ago uh, in Florida. And the question that I would like to pose to you is uh, while it is clearly necessary to acknowledge the wrongs, uh, and it is clearly necessary to publicly apologize, there is a difference between an apology that's a platitude and an apology that actually means something. Uh, an apology um, that, oh, I'm sorry that we wrongfully killed these people means nothing if it's not accompanied by significant reforms in the criminal legal system. And an apology uh, and a posthumous pardon of people whose lives we can no longer affect means nothing if we are not acting on a daily basis to correct the errors, uh, to rectify the errors, to redress the racial injustices that we see across the entire legal system. So when um, Governor Hogan grants 34 posthumous pardons and recognizes the injustices um, that happened all too frequently uh, in Maryland with these lynchings. What is being done to address the ongoing racial discrimination, the ongoing systemic bias, the ongoing injustices uh, in the legal system? Because if it's just an apology for the past, and it isn't accompanied by concrete action for the future, then it is not doing anybody any good. Uh, it, for a couple of, uh, I want to take one or two minutes, and then I'll save some things for later, but just give you some, some ideas. Um, it's even worse than what we've said so far uh, about the impact of the death penalty, um, race and the death penalty. Today, we announced the 186th exoneration from death row in the United States uh, since, um, since the death penalty came back in the 1970s. The exoneration was a man named Sherwood Brown in Mississippi, uh, who was framed for a murder he did not commit. He is the 100th African-American to be exonerated uh, in this time period. Uh, what it tells us is when it comes to wrongful convictions and convictions of the innocent, disproportionately, it is African Americans who are wrongly convicted and wrongly sentenced to death. The same thing, um, there, there's another impact, which is not only are more African Americans wrongly convicted, sentenced to death, and disproportionately sentenced to death, but it takes the legal system longer to grant them relief, if relief is granted at all. And we see the same thing when it comes to intellectual disability, people who are vulnerable for capital punishment, but are not legally permitted to be executed. Before it became unconstitutional to execute people with intellectual disability, um, we found 43 uh, people were executed and 27 of them were individuals of color, hugely disproportionate. We also know that under the current system, even after it became unconstitutional to execute people with intellectual disability, at least 20 were executed in Texas under an unconstitutional standard, and the bulk of them were African American. And when we look at the people who got relief, whose death sentences were overturned, 137 individuals so far, uh, have been found ineligible for the death penalty after they were sentenced to death because of intellectual disability, 80% are defendants of color. Age 18 or younger, it is unconstitutional to execute children. But there was a time 
not too long ago, even into this century in which it was constitutional. And 22 prisoners under the age of 18 at the time of their offense were executed before it was made unconstitutional and a majority of them were prisoners of color. It's still legal, oh, and overwhelmingly, although a majority of the uh, defendants were people of color, the victims in those cases were overwhelmingly white. And it's still legal to execute individuals who are under age 20, when we all know that they are still adolescent, their brains are still adolescent. And we looked at where those executions have happened. More than half of the individuals who were adolescent who've been executed, more than 60% are Black or Latinx. And when you look at Texas, which executed more than anybody else, the numbers are even higher. So that's just a picture uh, of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, what we know is that the death penalty um, is inextricably intertwined with our history of slavery, lynching, and Jim Crow. The people who are more vulnerable uh, to the death penalty, um, when they are sentenced to death, they are disproportionately individuals of color. Uh, and so if we're going to try to bring about reform, one of the most important arguments that needs to be made and needs to be understood is that the death penalty perpetuates racial discrimination. The death penalty legitimizes racial discrimination elsewhere, because if you will accept it when life is at stake, you will accept it uh, when almost anything else is at stake. Uh, and um, if you are going to have a full and fair debate about capital punishment, race needs to be at the forefront. So that's my part. Uh, hopefully, um, I, I'm not sure um, if uh, if Kenneth is uh, is back on yet. Do we know? Yes, I am still here on the live. Oh, terrific! Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, what has been said? Um, let me first start by saying. Um, thank you to Sandy Spring Museum for giving me this opportunity and allowing my voice to be heard to speak on this uh, topic, which I believe is one of the most important topics in our society today here in America. To tell you all a little bit about me and my thoughts and to speak about the death penalty from another angle. First of all, let me say that everything that has been said from my standpoint of listening to Robert and uh, the other person that spoke concerning lynching, racism, revenge, all of those things with capital punishment, I believe to be true. I know they are true. I am 47 years old. My entire adult life has been spent on death row. I was just released off of death row about six months ago. And I say this literally, my entire adult life, I was sentenced to death at 18 years old. Over the periods of years that I have been in prison, I've been in solitary confinement the entire time. I was sentenced to death as my punishment for my involvement in a crime where I did not kill the victim. It is a proven fact that I did not kill the victim. It is part of the reason why my sentence was commuted from life without parole, I mean, from, to life without parole from death. At the same time, I am here today because somewhere along my journey on death row, I felt that society had a wrong understanding about the death penalty. I felt that society had little knowledge about what was actually taking place with the death penalty. And I mean this in a lot of ways. 
We can speak about people who have been sentenced to death and that are innocent. We can speak about people who are literally on death row and guilty of heinous crime and try to justify the reason why they should be on death row. We can speak about box execution and why we shouldn't be doing these things. We can speak about all of these things and there are people around the country that are talking about these things. At the same time, people in America are probably about 50% from my last, close to 50% of what I understand from my last study and looking at the death penalty, believe in the death penalty. But I think that they have no clue, and I mean this literally, they have no clue of the inner workings of the death penalty. I want to say this, as far as my education to you all about the death penalty this evening, I ask the question of why are we doing this? If you are someone that believes in the death penalty, I ask you that question. Why are we doing this? And I ask that question from the standpoint of it doesn't make any sense to me. And when I say it doesn't make any sense to me, I'm not speaking about, you know, the the lynching aspect, the racism aspect. I'm speaking about the money that we spend. Why are we doing this? We put individuals on trial that are accused of crimes for the purposes and reasons to execute them. But when we look at the numbers, if we go and look at the history, we are not doing that. Yes, Texas execute people, Florida execute people, and people are being executed throughout the country. But when you look at the overall numbers, that is not what we're doing. We are spending millions upon millions of dollars for this project. 70% of the people that are sentenced to death, and roughly 70 some odd percent of the people that are sentenced to death, are never ever executed. So you tell me we are spending millions of dollars to put people on death row to execute them, but we never ever execute them? This doesn't make any sense to me. It makes no sense to me, none whatsoever, but that is what we are doing in America. And if you go look at the numbers, the number will tell you these things. There are a small majority of people who are sentenced to death that either commit suicide while on death row, die of natural causes while on death row, and about 12% are executed. 12%, somewhere within those numbers, are executed. So you mean to tell me all of these people that we have on death row throughout the United States, we are only executing 12% or so? But we're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars doing this. It doesn't make any sense. Look at the state of Alabama. In the history of the death penalty in the state of Alabama, about 800 people have been sentenced to death. Out of that 800 people, about 35 or 40 have, like I said, died because they committed suicide while on death row, died of natural causes while on death row, or executed. There are currently 170 people on death row out of that 800. And a large majority of those individuals will literally have their cases reversed because of ineffective sister counsel, overzealous prosecutors, and this is the norm in America. 590 some odd people have been released from death row. Their sentence commuted to life without parole, out of that 800. But look at the millions of dollars Alabama is spending. And this is so in every state in America. So when we say we believe in the death penalty, why? Why? When we truly see that we're innocent people being released from death row, we truly see where racism plays a part of the death penalty. We clearly see where revenge plays a part in the death penalty. Why are we doing this? It makes no sense to me. And as someone who has sat on death row for years, when I began to learn and realize these things, I felt motivated to try to educate people about these types of situations, these types of truths when it comes to the death penalty. 
And it's part of the reason why I am here today. It has led me to having this opportunity to speak to you all about the death penalty, the inner workings of it, and to question what are we doing, literally, as a society. And I'm not speaking to the people that are against the death penalty. I'm speaking to everybody. What are we doing? It is our responsibility as citizens when we know the truth to try to change things. But I don't feel that we are pushing our politicians enough to try to bring about change. And the things that I'm saying to you all this evening, go look it up. Get on the Death County Information website and look up these numbers. See how many people we have executed throughout the history of the death penalty. And you all will find that these numbers are actual factual. And I just wanted to say that a little bit. Thank you, Kenneth. I think that we'll have uh, some a little bit of time for Q&A now. Sorry. I can go ahead and get that started. Um, this may seem like a silly question, but is there any reason for any of us to feel hopeful that that change is coming? I actually think oh. there is, um, because change is coming. Uh, what we're seeing is the death penalty is um, is disappearing uh, in whole sections of the United States, uh, and um, and is being used significantly less, even in the counties that disproportionately account for it. Uh, if you take a look at the map of the United States. Um, you'll see that with Virginia's abolition of capital punishment, you can now drive from the Canadian border of Maine to the Cumberland Gap, uh, where Virginia meets Tennessee, without ever entering a state that has capital punishment. That's 1,300 miles. Uh, and um, in the western part of the United States, we've been near record lows uh, in, uh, in death sentences uh, for the last three years, even before the pandemic. Uh, we are we're going to release a study, we keep saying this, um, where uh, we were looking at uh, who's on death row across the United States. Uh, and uh, just barely 1.2% of the counties in the United States are responsible for half of everyone's on death row, which means that the death penalty really doesn't exist in most of the counties. Uh, and um, another thing is very important going forward, one state at a time, um, keeps abolishing the death penalty. It's almost one state uh, every year or so. But there's also a different kind of abolition at the county level. Uh, and this is where folks in, in Maryland uh, can have an impact in their own communities too, even though Maryland has abolished the death penalty. Uh, one of the main uh, trends we're seeing is the election of reform prosecutors. Uh, and reform prosecutors who say they don't want to impose the death penalty or will seek it only sparingly have been elected in the last five years in counties that currently comprise one third of the nation's death row. Uh, so that suggests that we're gonna see it used less and less, even as more and more states abolish it. Thank you. I, I would pretty much agree. Um, I think that it is optimistic when it comes to looking at the death penalty at this uh, stage of capital punishment in America. Uh, I believe that change is slow when it comes to the death penalty, but over the last uh, few years, we have, we've seen several uh, states continue to abolish the practice outright, and I think that, that will continue. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we aren't going to have setbacks, uh, and there are a number of states that are trying to ramp up executions right now. Um, uh, and I, I think with the end of the pandemic, uh, um, we are likely to see uh, an increase in, in executions over the short time. Um, but I'm, you're about to have a visitor here. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's going to be short term and, uh, and it's pretty geographically limited to the same states that were involved uh, historically with lynchings. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple questions here. Um, there's a question for Kenneth. Um, somebody asked, can you just tell us more about your art for those of us who haven't seen it? Oh, did we lose Kenneth? No, 
Can you repeat that question, please? Oh, sorry. Um, somebody asked if you could tell us more about your art. Um, I, I think most people here have not seen your art. Well, uh, I started creating art around the Jeff Tongue about 10 years ago, simply because I wanted to uh, educate people about the Jeff Tongue. And since then, I have uh, looked at art from a, a lot of different standpoints. And I believe that art is one of the valuable tools in trying to educate people about the Jeff Tongue. When I, when I did my first exhibit, which uh, took place, I believe it was in 2012, that opened in New York, Arkansas, it has been internationally shown uh, at this point. But one of the things that I was quickly aware of is an individual who could sit here and argue with me all day about capital punishment, about their views of... Uh, and debate with me about it. But when you put art in front of an individual, it's hard for them to argue with the art. It's hard for them to argue why it is that we execute someone at the age of 14. It's, it's hard to argue why we are spending the money that we're spending on capital punishment. It's hard to argue with the number of people that we continue to release from death row after being proven that they're innocent. And it is what I'm doing now, you know, um, that created exhibit led me to wanting to not only speak more about the death penalty, but also to form a museum on the history of the death penalty in America. And it is what I am doing now with uh, my nonprofit organization that I founded while I was on death row. Uh, to educate people about the history of the practice of death penalty in America. I feel that this is a, a hot topic subject. Uh, it is a, a subject that you can pretty much ask anybody in America and they got an opinion about the death penalty, whether they're educated about it or not. You know, they can tell you, well, I'm against it, but they don't really understand why they're against it, other than saying, I think it's wrong, you know? They can't tell you about the history of it, the lynching aspect, the race aspect, or people will say I'm for it. And they will say I'm for it because they seen a little 13 year old girl who was kidnapped and murdered. And they are on the, the feel of what the news media perpetuate about the death penalty. Uh, it is these things that, that led me to wanting to educate more uh, and talk more about the death penalty and even created museum. I say even to you all that we need this museum. We have museums in this country on man, some of everything, baby dolls. We have museums in this country on Cadillacs. We have museums in this country on space, racism. We've been doing this death penalty thing for 400 years. Why do we not have a museum on the history of the death penalty? We have a museum on slavery. Why do we not have a museum on the death penalty? We have a museum in this country on jelly beans, literally jelly beans. But we fear having a museum in this country on the death penalty when we all opinionated about it. Mm -hmm. So recreating art has led to this, wanting to grab the powers that be and put them in a circle and say, when will we actually have a museum on the history of the country? Mm -hmm. Not just to, to sit and look at and talk about the, the things that we know are true, but let's talk about the victims, how this has affected the victims, how this has affected jury members. There are a lot of people that sit on jurors and give individuals the death penalty and affected by it later on. How do we remember these things and educate society? Mm -hmm. So it is art that brought me to, to this point, not just the visual art aspect, but how do we do this through poetry, through storytelling, through movies, you know? Um, and 
this is where I'm at. Um, creating art around it, being a part of discussions like this one around the deaf community, trying to spark that dialogue, that idea, and that conversation on it's time that we create a national museum on the history and the practice of the deaf community in America. I am not satisfied with just having a small corner in the crime museum in D.C. on the death penalty, when we spend millions and millions of dollars on this. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say to you all about my art and why, you know, I am using my art to 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 educate people and to talk about the death penalty for this purpose and reason. And I say this to you all, this was born out of an individual that was sentenced to death at 18 years old, who was the youngest person sentenced to death at the time on death row, who had spent his entire adult life in prison, in solitary confinement on death row. I think it'd be a beautiful thing if we actually see that museum formed one day behind the idea that I came up with and pushed throughout the world uh, from solitary confinement and from the experience of my life of dealing with racism. And my story in itself is a, was a wild one. As I say, I'm, I'm finished to death and I didn't even kill anyone. Literally, I'm sitting on death row and I didn't even... People, this is the death penalty. You, you listen to me saying that I am sitting on the actual individual that killed the victim in the crime that I was a part of. He pled guilty to the crime before I went to trial and accepted a life without parole. He admitted to the fact that he was the gunman and that he deserved to be locked up for the rest of his life. Pled guilty to that. Yet and still, they put me on trial two weeks later and gave me the death penalty. Very well knowing that I did not kill the victim. This is the death penalty in America. It is a part of racism. It is a part of revenge. And even now, as we speak about mass incarceration, you know, criminal justice change, reform, and all of those things, I am someone that do not deserve to be in prison. I am someone that can give more to society. Everybody says this. I am doing lectures at places like Princeton, Yale, Stanford. I am someone that is having discussions on an international level about the death penalty. My community right now is saying that I should not be in prison. The politics, I remain in prison. I say to you all, and think about this. If art has brought me to this point, it is because of art that people are paying attention to me and my story. It's because of art that I am even on this panel with you all. But I say this to you. I did not kill the victim. I was sentenced to death. I have rehabilitated myself over the years of being in solitary confinement and sitting on death row. At this point in my journey, I have the mayor of my county, the two district representatives, of my county, the sheriff of my county, the chief circuit court judge of my county, the leader of the NAACP, several clergy members, all saying I should no longer be in prison. Mm-hmm. But I'm in prison. This doesn't make any sense to me. But as I say, I contributed to art to have the opportunity to, to do the work that I am doing. So sorry that that was a long answer to your question, but I hope I answered your question. You, you did, thank you. I know that um, we all discussed ahead of time that we really wanted to provide people with information for making an impact if, if they so desired. And we do have a question in the chat box for if people want to, you know, try to make an impact on their legislators or how do they how do they do that I mean, I think the first thing I w- would say is to, to kind of um, get information um, so we'll start plugging our website death penalty information center um, but I, I would say that um, there has been so much local and state movement around issues of racial justice and that have tied um, issues of of racial bias in the death penalty 
I think there are, are also a lot of cases that have become really high profile um, as far as uh, community support and activism around those. We saw, um, I mentioned Julius Jones in Oklahoma, Purvis Payne um, in Tennessee. I think that the um, kind of community activism has really raised the profile uh, of some of these cases and has helped people to understand some of the um, issues, uh, the racial justice issues that are endemic in the death penalty. We can even see the, the cases of, of folks um, who were executed and how that happened. Brandon Bernard's case, um, the federal system who was executed under the Trump administration, um, those federal executions were really designed to kind of show, oh, these are the worst of the worst folks um, death penalty is, is being used against. But I think the, the flip side was really apparent too about um, all the number uh, issues and, and problems with the death penalty across the country um, that were also present in the, the federal um, system as well. So I do think that there is a lot going on on, on kind of the state and local level in these broad range of, of cases or issues and then in individual cases. You know, in Maryland, uh, when it comes to capital punishment, you have in the fortunate situation that you no longer have the death penalty. Um, so that means that uh, if you want to be involved on, uh, on this issue, uh, you will, for the most part, uh, be looking to help uh, in things that are going on in other states or at the federal level. Uh, but I, again, I, I want to stress that uh, the capital punishment and what's going on with capital punishment uh, is symptomatic of the criminal legal system as a whole. Uh, and it's important to remain involved uh, at the local level um, for criminal legal reform and to try to make uh, the system uh, fairer and uh, uh, or less unfair uh, and more equitable. Um, if you want to be involved in, in capital punishment, um, where Maryland is still directly affected. We know this because uh, a Marylander was executed uh, by the Trump administration in January. Uh, it's at the federal level. Uh, and, uh, and for that, uh, I think it's important to let the um, administration know what you think. Uh, you have a president who is the first in American history uh, to be elected after saying that he sought um, that, that he was fa in favor of ending the federal death penalty and wanted to incentivize states to do the same thing. Uh, ask the administration what it's been doing. Uh, ask what steps uh, it intends to take uh, to ensure that uh, in the future, uh, another president can't come in and have the same kind of uh, aberrational uh, execution spree. Uh, we had more executions in the last six months and two days uh, of, uh, of the Trump administration uh, than in any one year period uh, in the United States at the federal level uh, since the 1800s. Uh, what is the administration doing uh, to ensure that something like that cannot happen uh, in a future administration? So those are things that you can do um, with respect to um, the federal death penalty. Uh, and there are numerous organizations uh, at the local and national level that are very deserving organizations uh, that you can uh, lend your assistance to uh, to bring about a fair criminal legal system across this country. Thank you. Kenneth, did you want to add anything else to that um, question? Well, I think that they stated and put it very well, in my opinion. Thank you. And somebody just shared in the um, the chat box where um, people can see Kenneth's art and um, learn more about his background. Um, with that, I just want to thank our panelists for joining us tonight. Um, this was such an interesting um, conversation and um, such an important topic for us to be talking about. I, I really appreciate Kenneth um, taking the time to join us and also our speakers from the Death Penalty Information Center. And I do want to Thank Wendy Jason for joining us from the Justice Arts Coalition, who um, gave us the opportunity for showing um, the art in the museum, which led to this program. So we will be having one more program in October that's in conjunction with um, this exhibit, which is about 
sentencing discrimination in gender, um, that, that women are given harsher punishments more frequently than men are. And um, we'll be discussing that with an organization that um, is trying to rectify that situation. But with that, I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for uh, shedding light on, on this topic. Absolutely. Thank you.